I'm entitling today, What is Going On? What is going on? Can you say that with me today? Now, I need your participation in this sermon today because I need your help. And so every time I kind of refer to the, the front board here, I want you to shout out. That's about 75%. Let's try it one more time. Have you ever felt in your life, because of circumstances, situations, pressures, stresses of life, where things are not working out like you thought they would work out, what is going on? Well, I want to talk about that today just for a, a little bit. And so that's my title. My theme today is when God, when you feel God has led you to do something, directed you, led you with all of your heart, you, you believe it was the Lord. And the bottom falls out. Somewhere in the midst of that journey, coming to the place of fruition of that direction of the Lord, if you will, the bottom falls out, leading and leaving you to believe that you're a failure. Has God ever spoken to you to do something, to go somewhere, to give of your time, maybe to give of your talent, maybe to give of your, your treasure, only to see it seemingly blow up on the way to see it through. It could be a marriage. Maybe you really believe that God led you to this man or led you to this woman. You got married, and in the journey, there was infidelity. In the journey, there was separation, maybe divorce, or maybe even death. Buying a home, developing a team. You believe this is the team that, that, that God has called me to, to develop, and somewhere along the line, it, it blows up. Building a business, pouring into an investment, maybe your schooling, maybe ministry of some sort. You believe with all your heart that God was directing you, God was leading you, the Spirit of God, the cloud of God was moving, and you followed it ministerially wise, and, and it just blew up. Maybe becoming a partner in a venture. Whatever it may be. I want to talk to somebody today that, that, that believed in their lives that God led them. And as you, as you sought to obey his voice and his will, in the journey, something happened. The bottom fell out. It blew up. Something happened. And you, you find yourself, what? What is going on? Now, you got to say it with a little New Jersey attitude. What's going on, man? What is going on? I want to show you this little clip. You're familiar with facing the giants. The man in this, the coach in this movie asked the question, what is going on? Have you been to school? Have you been to school all this time? Yes. I tried to call you an hour ago. Is everything all right? Grant, talk to me. I don't know where to start. What's going on? I was trying to lock up for Steve. And I overheard Dan meeting with some fathers. They didn't know I was there. Brooke, they're pushing him to get rid of me. Neil Prater, Alvin Purvis, Luke Ray. And they said I wasn't capable of winning. Call me dead weight. They can't make Dan fire you. You still got support. You, you just go get JT and Brady and see him tomorrow. Brady was there. They've just lost confidence in me. You know, I was so sure I could turn this program around. And I've just sunk it lower. 
Brooke, I've tried so hard. Why can't I win? You can win. Stop beating yourself up, Grant. Brooke, I can't provide you a decent home. I can't provide you a decent car. I'm a failing coach with a losing record. And I can't give you the children you want. What? It's me. Like everything else is me. We can't have our own children because of me. What's God doing? I mean, why is this so hard? It's okay, Grant. That's going on. Have you ever been there? Bottom falls out, leaving you to believe you're a failure. I want you to consider these verses, four verses. There's many, but let me share these four with you. Psalms 34, verse number 19. Psalms 34. Verse number 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous. Come on, say it with me. But the Lord delivereth him out of them all. Many are the afflictions, but God deliver us from them all. Isaiah 43, verse number 2. Isaiah 43, verse number 2. When you pass through the waters... I will be with you. And when you go through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. You won't drown. And even when you have to walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, neither, neither shall the flame kindle upon you. Aren't you glad that this promise is that God will be with us during waters? He's with us during deep waters. He's with us in the storms of life uh, when the fire is, is blazing in our life and it looks like we're going to get burnt up and burnt out. My God, he's with us. Philippians chapter 1, verse number 6 says this. Someone wants to hear this promise today. Being confident. Everyone say, I have confidence. Being confident of this very thing that he, which has begun a Good work. I want you to know that he has begun a good work in you. He that has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day or bring it to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. So be confident, somebody. Even if it feels like the, the, the bottom has fallen out. Things have blown up. You don't understand what's going on like the man in the movie. What is happening what is going on? Be confident that the good work that God has started in your life, no matter what it looks like right now, he's going to bring it to completion. He is going to bring it to the other side. Somehow, some way, he is going to bring you through. In Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse number 6. Deuteronomy 31, verse, verse 6. Be strong and of good courage. Be strong and of good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them, whatever the them is in your life. For the Lord your God, he it is that doth go with thee. He's with you. He will not fail you, nor forsake you. Aren't you glad about that? These are just four of many, many promises that remind us, though we can go through rough times, Hit stone walls, bottom falling out, whatever the case may be, we have a God who has promised to deliver us, prevent us from going under, will see us through, and show up when we need him. He is a present help in our time of need. Can you say amen? amen. 
I want to encourage the body of Christ today. No matter what you're going through, I know it's real, I know it's sensitive, I know it's difficult. Maybe the darkest hour, the most difficult season in your life. Uh, you started out the journey. God led you. You believe God directed you. The Spirit of God was bringing you along. You were doing and obeying what you believe God said to do. And then whammo is going on, Lord. What is happening here? It does not look like it looked like when you told me to do this. What's going on? I want to give you some examples in the Bible. I'll, I'll do this as quick as I can. People in the Bible that were led by the Spirit of God, directed by the Lord himself, and in the journey, in the process, as they fleshed out in obedience the word of the Lord to their lives, the bottom fell out. Now listen, when the bottom falls out, so to speak, or the ensnarements or the entrapments are set, or there's a, a pit dug for you to fall into it, or whatever the case may be, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's over. We have to look for God to show up during that time. Again, if he said it, he'll bring it to pass. If he spoke it, he'll make it good. God does not direct us to do something to kill us. You might feel like it. You might go through such difficult, pressure-packed times that you feel like the life of God is being squeezed out of you. Whether it's maritally, parentally, vocationally, ministerially, emotionally, whatever the case may be. What is going on? But if you look for Jesus to show up in that moment, I promise you, because his promise says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Amen. There's been times in all of our lives, if you didn't say it, if you didn't speak it verbally, you thought it mentally. Where is God? Am I the only... Un non-spiritual guy here there's people that aren't sitting in their seats today because they had the thought and the devil put it there that God has forsaken them they bought into it and if you give that much place Ephesians 4 says do not give place to the devil doesn't mean that doesn't mean that you don't invite him to your house for dinner that means you don't buy into his lies those foul thoughts. Because if you buy into those thoughts, listen to me, he will give you more thoughts and more thoughts. The, object, the objective of Satan is to get you away from God. Now, here's the good news. Even if you run away from God, he's not going to run away from you. He will not force himself on you, but because his promise his covenant word cannot be changed or altered. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. He won't violate our own volition, our own will, but he will not alter or change his promise for nothing. Let me give you a couple of examples. I first want to talk about two men. After Barnabas was released from Paul's ministry, he took on another man of God that started his second missionary journey by the name of Silas. I want to talk about Paul and Silas for a moment in Philippi, in Acts chapter number 16. And you know the story. I feel like I'm on a boat with this. I don't fish, but I feel like I'm on a boat. Acts 16, verses 16 and onward, Paul embraces a co-laborer by the name of Silas, as I said, and they start out in what we call or refer to as Paul's second missionary journey. On that journey, he comes to a place called Philippi, and the Bible's in the verse number 16. It's, 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 it's a good thing. Watch this. And it came to pass as we went to prayer. 
to go into a prayer meeting. How many know that, that, that your flesh doesn't lead you to a prayer meeting and the devil doesn't lead you to a prayer meeting? How many know that it's God-ordained and God-led? <laughs> God leads us to prayer. So the Spirit of the Lord is leading Paul and Silas and those with them to a prayer meeting. Everyone say prayer is good. As you, as, as you go down to the, into the story, we, 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 we read that there was a, a young girl there who was in the occult. And, and she had a, a spirit of divination. She was possessed because she opened herself up to cultish things. And the occult, she got possessed by a demon or demons of, 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 of divination, spiritualism. Okay? And so... So she's following Paul, she's listening to him, and one day Paul realizes that this girl is bound, and he turns to the girl, and he casts out the spirit. He turned to the girl, but he cast out the devil in her. And because of that, people that, if you will, were, were pimping her out, making money off of her, and, and her, and her, her uh, weird, occultist ways, uh, they got angry at Paul and Silas, finally threw them in prison. Now they're going to a prayer meeting, but they end up in prison. Oh, you missed it. I said they're going to a prayer meeting and they end up beat up in prison. What, what's going on here? In, in verse number 23, and when they had laid many stripes upon them, and these are not, these are not military stripes. Hello? These are stripes that you get from a whip, a cat of nine tail. And when they had laid many stripes upon Paul and Silas, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who having received such a charge, put them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stock. So they're supposed to go to prayer. They're in a prayer meeting. They end up in prison. But verse number 25, I want you to see it. How many know that there's times that God gives us keys, God gives us keys that will unlock the mess that we are in, enabling him to manifest his presence and his power. Now, now, now in, the midst of our, uh, in the midst of our prisons, if you will, we can and bawl and squall and, and murmur and complain and cry and sing, oh, oh, woe is me, and probably nothing will happen. Paul and Silas chose not to take that direction. They didn't do that approach. The Bible says in verse number 25, at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed, and they praised God. I said they prayed and they praised. Amen. They pray and they praise. The Bible says, and the prisoners heard them, but more important, God heard them. And suddenly, verse 26, there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all, all the doors were open. And everyone's bands were loosed. Praise God. They went to prayer and up in prison. They probably thought, what in the world is going on here? But they decided, they chose to take a direction. Hey, listen, we're going to pray. We're going to praise. And God shows up. That method will work for you and I. That method will work for you and I because we're all going to face some form of, of incarceration, whether it's emotionally, whether it's financially, whether it's morally. We feel like we're locked up, we're bound, we're in a prison, if you will. It's not the time to sing, oh, woe is me. Why did I do this in the first place? Uh, I'm doubting God. Did he really speak to me? What's up with this guy I married, this woman I married? No, no. pray and praise, and the same manifestation that Paul and Silas received could be yours. The bands were loosed. Bands were loosed, and God set them free. God showed up. Amen? How about in Exodus chapter number 12? Exodus 12, let's talk about Moses and Israel just for a couple of moments here. I'll give you a few examples as far as we can go, and then we'll just pray. Exodus 12, verses, verses 40 and 
41. This is the great story of the Exodus. God's people, the Jewish people, the Hebrew people, from the time of Joseph and beyond, became enslaved in Egypt. Israel is in Egypt enslaved, the Bible says, for 430 years total, from start to finish. But this is also a story how God delivered his people and leads them out of bondage. In Exodus 12, verses 40, now the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. Watch this, verse 41. And it came to pass at the end of the 430th year, even the very same day, to the day, it came to pass that all the host of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. You remember the story well. God, on his eagle, eagle's wings, if you will, the Bible says, is delivering, is carrying out his beloved out of Egypt en route to the promised land. Praise God. It's the Spirit of God. It's the power of God. God himself. It was a cloud by day, pillar of fire by night. God is leading his people out of bondage into freedom and victory. Wow. It's awesome. But if you continue the story, as they start, as they start their march toward the promise of God, God gave them a promise. He told, he told Moses way back in Exodus chapter number 3 and 4, you are going to bring my people back to, to Mount Sinai and they're going to worship me on this mountain. They're in Egypt, bound, enslaved, and oppressed, but God leads them. God delivers them. They're en route to fulfilling the promise of God. God speaks through a man. The man tells the people. The people obey, and they're on their journey. And the bottom falls out. Good. Good. Exodus 14, verse number 5. Exodus 14, verse number... What's going on here? Pharaoh finally, finally, after 10 plagues hit Egypt, he finally succumbs, he finally surrenders, and says, the people of God can go. And then once again, pride rises up, grips his heart, and he changes his mind. Verse number 5, and it was told the king of Egypt, I'm in 14, verse 5, chapter 14 of Exodus, verse 5. And it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled. And the heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned against God's people. And they said, why have we done this? That we have let Israel go from serving us. And when you follow that down to verse number 12 you realize that they start to pursue. Pharaoh and his great Egyptian army, they leave the headquarters, if you will, and they start to pursue Israel as Israel already has started their journey to the promised land. They meet, they meet God's people at the Red Sea, at the Red Sea. Pharaoh and his army in hot pursuit, a wilderness around them, and a Red Sea before them. God's delivering his people. He's leading them out. The people of God respond in obedience to that leading. Pharaoh pursues and starts to threaten God's people. Israel had to be thinking, what's going on? What is happening? But notice verses 13 through 21. I'll just read a couple of verses. Verses 13 of, of chapter 14, and Moses said unto the people, fear not. Isn't that a good, encouraging word? The reason why you see the, hear those terms or read those terms so much in the Bible, fear not, do not be afraid, do not be dismayed, whatever, is because fear will always paralyze our faith. And it takes faith to be released from our heart to believe God for a manifestation of his presence. Fear, fear not, fear not. Stand still and see the salvation 
of the Lord, which he will show you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you shall see them again. Amen. For the Lord shall fight for you. Oh, that'll preach, huh? Verse 14. The Lord shall fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. The Lord's going to do this. The Lord's going to show up. And you know the story. Verse number, verse number 21. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord... He showed up, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided, and the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon dry ground, and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left hand. My God, they, they're led by the Lord out of Egypt, but the bottom falls out. Their enemy that, that said he would not pursue them started to pursue them. He threatens to kill them, but God shows up. The man of God stands up there and says, don't be afraid, fear not. See the self, just stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. God's going to show up. God didn't lie to us back there in Egypt. He said, he'll bring us out to take us in. And even though on the journey, beloved, when we see some of these things happening, it doesn't necessarily mean that things have changed. Sometimes God will alter them some things, but for the most part, if God said, said it, if he gave a direction, uh, my God, even though adversity and calamity comes, even maladies and mess-ups and blow-ups, keep on trusting God. Pray, praise, fear not, stand still, and expect to see the salvation of the Lord, and God will show up. God will show up. Let's continue to talk about the children of Israel. They, they, they get through this Red Sea, just like, just like God said he'd bring them through. They come to a place called Rephidim in Exodus chapter number 17. They're in their wilderness journey. They come to Rephidim chapter 17, verse number 1. Let's read it. And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys according to the commandment of the Lord. This is God commanded, God directed. Are you here? And encamped in Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. How many know it gets thirsty in the desert? So let's understand this here. Again, God directs. God commands. God is leading them again by a pillar of cloud, the pillory cloud by day, pillar of fire by night. That's how God is. He's literally being their personal tour guide. He is their personal GPS. He is the navigation system. He is leading them with his own eye. And so they respond to the commandment of the Lord and they get to Rephidim. God is leading us. They've just seen a great miracle in, in the Red Sea being parted. They get to Rephidim and there's no water. <laughs> what is going on, Lord? What's happening here? Did you lose your power from the Red Sea to Rephidim? Have you lost all your power? Have you forsaken me? Have you changed your mind? Have you altered your covenant? Are you mad at us? There's no water. We are thirsty. We can't go on another hour unless we partake of some, of some water. What is going on? What is going on? The Bible says they thirsted there and they even murmured against their pastor Moses and questioned why why did you bring us out here wasn't egypt good enough for us to die why come why come out here and kill us and and our children and all of our belongings and cattle and so on in verse number four and moses cries to the lord saying what shall i do with all these people they're they're ready to stone me lord the lord said unto moses go on before the people and take with you of the elders of israel Take the rod that I gave you and smite the river and 
that, that you smote the river with and take it in your hand and go. And behold, I will stand, verse 6, I will stand before you there upon a rock in Horeb, and you shall hit the rock, smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did just that in the sight of the elders of Israel. Wow. God commands and directs their steps. They get on the journey. They get to Rephidim. There is no water. What is going on? But yet, God gives instruction. Moses seeks God's face. God says, take that rod that you use to stretch over the Red Sea, that I part it, and you smite the rock, and I will give you water out of that rock. God shows up again. In the midst of a drought, in the midst of a great need, in the midst of a miracle that is absolutely needed, if they don't get it, they die, God shows up. How many know the timing of God is impeccable? I've said it once, I'll say it again. He's usually not early, but he's never late. He's never late. He's always on time. Let's go on a little bit more with the journey. Numbers chapter number 10. Numbers chapter number 10. Moses is building a team, if you will. And this team decides to rebel, maybe in business, maybe in the sports arena, maybe in some kind of business venture. You have built a team, maybe politically or, or, or governmentally or whatever the case may be. You've built a team. And in the midst of God directing you to build a certain team, it could be, it could be workers on your job that work for you. Maybe you... you, you you have your own business and you've built a, a team of people. And somewhere along the journey, it blows up. You know that you handpicked each and every one of these people, but something happened in the process. Let's talk about that. It happened to Moses. Numbers chapter 10, verse number, verse number 33. Let's read. Are you there? And they departed from the mountain of the Lord three days journey and the ark of the covenant of the Lord went before them this is the presence of God the ark of the covenant housed the presence of God and so the presence of God goes before them in the three days journey to search out a resting place for them and the cloud of the Lord was upon them by day and when they went out of the camp and it came to pass when the ark set forward that Moses said, rise up, Lord, and let all of your enemies be dispersed and scattered. And let them that hate you flee before thee. And when it rested, he said, return, O Lord, unto the many thousands of Israel. So again, they're, they're in the journey here. They're in the journey. They've already been to, to uh, uh, Mount Sinai, and now they're continuing on. They're continuing on to the promised land. God is directing them. The very Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God, the Shekinah glory that came out of that Ark is leading them to the next resting place, to the next campsite. Are you with me? It's God directed. The presence of God is leading them through the Ark. Chapter 11, verse number 1, God leading Moses, Moses, Moses leading his team, and the team blows up. It blows up before Moses. And when the people complained, verse number one of chapter 11, it displeased the Lord and the Lord heard it. And his anger was kindled and the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed those who were in the farthest parts of the camp. So here we see that in the, in the, in the midst of, of this, this glorious sight, God and his presence, his glory leading all these people, Moses and the team that he's built, if you will, 
Now all of a sudden, there's a resting place. It's awesome. They're, they're camping out. They're enjoying the presence of God. They're enjoying each other. They're enjoying what God is doing. They're testifying, letting each other know, reminding each other what a God we serve. Remember the Red Sea. Remember the water in Rephidim. Here they are, but somewhere along the line, some people get nervous in the service. Somewhere along the line, some people thought, you know, I want to tell you something. Complaining is contagious. Contagious. It's like a foul disease. A contagious disease. Maybe, maybe sort of with one person. We have examples in the Bible that all the congregation complained with only one or two that started it. It's very possible. It's not, it's not pie in the sky idea. This is biblical. Just with a couple people. When God sent out the, the 12 spies, only two came to, with a bad report. And the Bible says those two, I'm sorry, 10 people had a bad report, two people had a good, good report. But just 10 people that came back with a, with a bad report, just 10. Everyone say 10. 10. Just 10 people turned the hearts of probably at that time 1.7, 1.8 million people. Just 10. Just 10. And so it's... it's, 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 it's very possible that one person, two people, started to complain about whatever. Whatever. You know, the internet's not fast enough out here. You know, I'm tired of looking at this sand. Why did water have to come, come out of the rock? Why couldn't Coca-Cola come out of the rock? Whatever. And the Bible says it started throughout the camp and they all start complaining. And the Bible says God heard their complaint. Now, I, 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 I can't ever say that I could think like God or try to know what God is thinking. His, his thoughts are higher than mine. But I would think after a few times, after a few miracles, just a few, even one, Red Sea parting, water from a rock, bitter waters turning sweet, Manna, bread, raining down from heaven. That already happened. That's happening also in this portion, chronologically speaking. That happens back in Exodus. I would think that God would say, I expect my people to trust me by now. And so I can understand very easily, Lord, you're listening. I can understand you getting angry. I wouldn't get angry at that point if I, if I was God. I'd be throwing javelins. Forgive me. But come on. Come on. Red Sea. Water from a rock. Bitter waters turning sweet. Bread sent down from heaven. What else do you need me to do? What are they complaining about? The ark is leading them. They're resting. God's given them shade in the daytime. The cloud is not only leading them. It's obscuring the sun. He's giving them light in the darkness because he's leading them with a pillar of fire. It's lighting up their lives. People will find something to complain about. There had to be at least one person in this congregation that said it was too cold. <laughs> at least one person had to say it was too hot. Moses, you preached too long. Oh, I'm going there. The people start complaining. I'm sure Moses probably asked that question. What is going on? Verse number two, the people cried unto Moses. And in turn, Moses cried and prayed unto the Lord. And the fire was quenched. The fire was quenched. God shows up again and he responds. Do you see that? Again, that common thread is, is prayer, is contriteness, is repentance. How many know that God is near to those? Come on of a broken spirit and a contrite heart. 
Contriteness, a penitent heart, brokenness, listen, draws the presence of God. He resists the proud, but gives grace to the I don't know about you, but I, when my, the bottom falls out in my life, when things blow up, I believe he's leading me, but somewhere along the journey and the process, it blows up. I don't want to respond by pointing my finger at God and saying, Who do you think, what do you think you're doing in my life? You should be blessed that I'm serving you. No, no, no. That's not going to turn things around real quick. Because he resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And the people realized, what are we doing? And they, they cried out to Moses. They were repenting. And Moses cries out to the Lord, and the Bible says God responds. He shows up, and the fire that was killing people stopped. Give you another example. One of my favorites, so dear to my heart, Psalms 23, because it's personal. God told me in 1981 that I was going to go into full-time ministry. I was only saved two years and 11 months at that time. But I knew God was leading me to leave the secular business world. Great job, made a lot of money, had a tremendous situation. But I knew God spoke to me to serve him full-time, if you will, in a full-time capacity and serve his people. And I obeyed. I obeyed. And I did that for years. First phase of my ministry, serving my pastor, holding up his hands, doing whatever he wanted me to do. I did a little bit of everything. Second phase of the ministry I started, that was to pastor, senior pastor, this ministry here, and in the midst of that journey, in 2006, in my life, the bottom fell out. It blew up physically. Oh, if you, if you lived at my house, you would have heard that a lot. What is going on? So Psalms 23 is dear to me because... It literally, that psalm got me through many, many nights that the devil tried to convince me of I would never see the dawn of day. Psalms 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restores my soul, my emotions. He leads me. Who leads me? He's leading me in the path of righteousness for his namesake. Now think about that. Verses 1, 2, and 3 of Psalms 23. He's my pastor. He's my shepherd. He's not just the shepherd of, 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 the, of the world. He's my shepherd. He's my personal pastor. Amen? Amen. In him there is no lack. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I shall not lack. I don't need anything if I have him. That's really what it means. Praise God. He, he makes me lie down in green, lush pastures. He leads me beside still and pristine waters. Hallelujah. He restores the emotional imbalances in my life. He brings, he brings stability and security and strength to my emotions. He restores my soul. And he even directs me. He leads me on the path of righteousness. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Wait a minute. I've been walking, being led by God on the path of righteousness. He leads me on the path of righteousness for who? For his namesake. I'm doing the will of God. I'm walking after God. 
I'm being led by the Spirit of God for His name's sake, for His glory. And somewhere along the process, the journey, the road takes me down a slippery slope of a valley that's called the valley of the shadow of death. What is going on? Oh, you don't... You, you, uh, yeah. Are you here? Have you ever been there? It's going wonderful. It's my pastor. I, I don't need anything as long as Jesus is with me. It's like... I got everything I need. I'm eating from green pastures. The word is so rich. I'm drinking of the water of life freely. Those pristine waters. My emotions are being restored. I'm on this wonderful journey, this wonderful path of righteousness for his namesake. And my God... Why'd I do that? <laughs> All of a sudden, I take a plunge into the valley of the shadow of death. What? Maybe you've never been there. I've been there. I've been there. But verse 4, part B, and the rest of the psalm. Yea, though I... Walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil. Here it is. For you are with me. You are with me. God shows up in the valley because he promised never to leave me nor forsake me. Even if the bottom falls out, even if it blows up, Thou art with me, and thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. They comfort me. The rod. What is the rod of a shepherd? The rod of a shepherd wards off the predators, the enemies, if you will, that can hurt you. And the staff is used to lead you, to bring you back to to where you belong, to bring comfort to you. Some scholars feel the rod and the staff were one and the same things, but with two functions. The shepherd's crook. It could ward off the predators, protecting the sheep, but could also, with the hook, lead those sheep. Are you here? Thy rod and thy staff, it comforts me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. He will anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. God shows up. You're walking. He's leading you on the path of righteousness. Boom, something happens on the journey, and now you're in the valley of the shadow. Thou art with me. I want someone to hear that today, no matter where you are, no matter how far you have fallen, how dismayed you are, whatever the bank account says, whatever the creditors are threatening you with, I want you to hear that He is with you. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord. I don't need forever. I don't need an elder calling me and asking me where I've been for three Sundays. Because I've experienced in the valley the goodness and mercy of God. It is not a chore to gather with the saints of God in public worship. I'm not going to work on a Sunday. I'm not going to do those things. I'm the, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and thank Him for His goodness and His mercy and what He's done for me in the valley. In the valley. In the valley. Because that's where He showed up. In the valley. Don't get mad at me. It's the truth. It's the valley. We got to find out where people are at. 
When you experience the goodness of God, the mercy of God, you, you won't need any elder ever call you ever again. Amen. My God. No longer will the pastor have to pray for 50 degrees and sunny on a Sunday. Because if it's lower than 50, it's too cold. They don't come out. But it's higher than 50, we go down the shore. 50 degrees, Lord. Not 49 and not 51. 50 de- don't come out at 50 degrees. You're getting mad at me now, but that's okay. I got the microphone. I'll give you one more and that's it. I don't have to. Five of you want it. I'll give you one more. Let's talk about the storm. Mark chapter number four. Mark chapter number four. Yeah. They get, don't talk about that stuff, Pastor, because they get people upset. I'm not, looking, I'm not looking to hurt people. I'm not looking to upset people. I'm looking to mature people. I'm not looking to raise up an army, a team that will literally change the culture today. It's going to take some commitment on our part, some dedication and devotion. You know the story here. Mark chapter 4, verse number 35. This is Jesus himself saying these words. And the same day when the evening was come, Jesus said unto them, let us pass over to the other side. That is the other side of the Sea of Galilee. They're on this side. Actually, they're probably on the, they're on the, they're on the western side. And he said, let us pass over to the other side. Let us go to the other side. We need to get over the Sea of Galilee. God directed, spirit led, Jesus commanded. And when they had sent away the multitude, verse number 36, they took him even as he was in the boat, and there was also with him other little boats. And there arose, everyone say arose. There arose, I'm I'm, I'm speaking of the King James here. And there arose a great storm of wind. And the waves beat into the boat so that it was now full. And he was in the stern of the boat, asleep on a pillow. That is Jesus. And his friends in the boat awoke him and said unto him, Master, don't you care that we're going to die? I like verse number 39. The storm arose in verse number 37. But now in verse number 39, now Jesus arose. (laughs) Do you see that? I like that. There could be storms that rise up in your life. Now listen to this. Listen to this. Jesus tells them, his friends, they're ministering. The ministry came to an end there. And he said, let's go over to the other side. As As they're rowing to the other side, there arose a great storm. Jesus just told us to get into the boat and to go to the other side. And we're in the midst of this great tempest, and our lives are in danger. What's going on, Lord? What's happening here? You told us to get into the boat. You told us. We heard you with our ears tell us to get into this boat and go to the other side. We're fighting a storm and adding insult to injury. You decided to take a siesta. How many know that Jesus is the God-man? All God, all man. In his, in his humanity, he was sleeping. But Psalms 121 says, our God neither slumbers nor sleeps. God never sleeps. Are, are you hearing? Don't you care that we're going to die? And the Bible says, Jesus arose. Whatever storm rises in your life, I want you to know about one who rises up higher. Higher. Higher than any storm, any attack, any onslaught of the enemy that will try to take you out. When those things rise up, Jesus shows up and he rises up higher. Yes, yes, he rises up and he rebukes the storm. 
He rebukes the wind and says to the sea, Peace, be still, and the wind ceased. The storm stopped, and there was a great calm. It's not time to jump overboard. It's not time to accuse Jesus. Just look to him. Look to him. I know it's frightening. The storm could be frightening and threatening and intimidating. There could be great trepidation on our parts. But listen, Jesus is in the boat with you. He's only sleeping in his humanity, but he is the God-man, all God, all man, and God never sleeps, never slumbers. He's always watching out for us. Always watching out for us. God will show up. I said God will show up. Do not fear. Do not doubt or second-guess yourself in the journey. If you believe God has led you, don't doubt. Even if there are incarcerations, enemies trying to take you out, life-threatening conditions, the team you built rebelling and blowing up, the valley of death or the storms of life, God will show up if you're expecting Him to. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Truth is, he has always been there with you. Amen? When we say God shows up, really, he is there, but we just finally recognized him. Like Cleopas and his friend, the two men on the road to Emmaus, they're walking with Jesus the whole time. But all of a sudden, their eyes are open and they recognize him. They didn't know he was with them the whole time until their eyes were open. May God open up our spiritual eyes and know that Jesus is always with us. Amen? Let's watch the one-minute clip. The end of the story in Grant Taylor's life because... He didn't know what was going on either, but God showed up in his storm, in his valley. Amen? And he'll show up in yours. Well, look who just walked in this house. Couldn't be the state champion coach Grant Taylor, could it? Because he's not supposed to live here. He's supposed to be out looking for a job. Yeah, I did it, Brooke. He did it. He gave me his job. Provided for our needs. Took away my fear. He throws in the state championship just because he can. It's been one of the best days of my life. The day's not over yet. What do you mean? Grant Taylor, I just want you to know that you've made the team. What team? The daddy team. We're going to have a baby. We're going to have a baby. Tell me, Coach Taylor. Tell me what's impossible when God's on your side. Oh, God. Oh, God, I'm overwhelmed. <laughs> to all my brothers and sisters, I feel like a failure. You don't understand what's going on, what is going on. I believe God has led me. Bottom has fallen out. Things have blown up. Things are not the way I thought they were going to be. My future is not going the way I thought it was going. I want you to know somehow, some way, if you look to God, 
pray, praise, and stay in expectation, the Lord is going to show up. And he will take you through the valley of the shadow of death. He will bring you to the other side. Amen. He will take you into the promised land that he promised you. Let's stand together.